Historically, comics have been both an important battleground over the representation of queer sexuality in media and an important medium for the expression of queer subtext. In today's lecture, we're going to explore this with an analysis of the figure of the queer superhero. Don't get jealous of this figure, though. It's not their birthday. It's you. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. It's a great day. That's what we say. Happy birthday. So let's start broad with the medium itself. Uh, here's a quote from Derek Scott and Ramsey Fawaz in an essay called Queer About Comics from just 2018. Quote, There's something queer about comics, whether one looks to the alternative mutant kinships of superhero stories, the epitome of the queer world making. Um, they're referring to X-Men there, by the way. The ironic and socially negative narratives of independent comics, the epitome of queer anti-normativity or the social stigma that makes the medium marginal, juvenile, and outcast from proper art, the epitome of queer identity. Comics are rife with the social and aesthetic cues commonly attached to queer life. So the argument here is that comics themselves have really important intersections with queer culture in general. Uh, and as a result of that, we have to expect that the dominant genre of comics, the superhero, have some important intersections there as well. And that's what we're going to look at today uh, in a variety of different forms. Uh, as usual, I'll give you a little bit of theory, a little bit of history, uh, and then we'll start to apply before pushing towards the discussion questions that we can work with on the boards. Okay, so the sort of flashpoint for this controversy, and let's be clear, this was a massive controversy in comics in general, uh, one that sustained for at least several decades thereafter. Uh, begins in the 1950s. Superhero comics have been accused of being subversively homosexual since the 1950s, Note that superheroes are like barely a decade old at that point in time. Uh, so the big text here is a book called Seduction of the Innocent by Dr. Frederick Vertham in 1954. Vertham was a very prominent psychologist, best known for working with juvenile delinquents. Um, and that's sort of where this idea emerged. He wanted to know what made juvenile delinquents delinquent. Uh, and he noticed that a lot of his patients were avid comics readers. So he jumped to the conclusion that comics were making people delinquent. Um, any half intelligent scientist or even non-scientist will recognize that that's a massive bit of what's called specious reasoning. The reason that most of his juvenile delinquents were comics readers is because most kids were comics readers in the 1950s. Um, so yeah, this was a really, really flawed study, but it became very popular. Uh, and Wortham sort of started a grassroots movement at the same time, um, trying to get comics banned, more or less, because he felt they were corrupting the youth of America. Good intentions, terrible researcher. Um, we've also since done some um, like backtracking into the evidence that he presents, and a lot of it appears to be completely fabricated. So he'll cite case studies of like a particular patient, and we have no record of that patient existing. So there's a lot of controversy around Frederick Vertham. Um, he's regarded as, well, Stan Lee called him a huckster once, um, someone who was very good at spinning a narrative in order to get their name in the papers. Anyway, um, my subtextual <laughs> anger <laughs> might be showing there. Um, there's a lot of people who believe that Frederick Vertham set comics back uh, just, just decades. Uh, in fact, it's, it's even more than that. Comics have never recovered uh, the sales that they had in the 1950s. So this guy knocked comics down hard. Anyway, um, so in his book, Seduction of the Innocent, which is a nicely salacious title, uh, he claims that Batman and Robin are, quote, a gay wish dream of two homosexuals living together. Now, this is extremely problematic for a lot of reasons. Well, one, Batman and Robin were very popular. This was looked at as a kind of iconic mentorship, friendship, partnership, whatever you want to call it. So suggesting that it was in fact subconsciously or subtextually, uh, again, a sexual relationship between the two of them was sketchy, especially given Robin's age and the fact that Batman is his legal guardian. Um, so there's all kinds of ways in which this helped to vilify homosexuality in general, uh, making Batman and Robin um, 
this example of how queer stories are making it into the media uh, and endorsing all manner of what they considered quite literally, like it's in the comics code, perversions. Uh, and then the second one, Wonder Woman. Um, he actually suggests that Wonder Woman is just kind of the, the female equivalent of Batman, which makes no sense based on even his reading of Wonder Woman, but we'll explore that. So he says that the homosexual connotation of the Wonder Woman type of story is psychologically unmistakable. Um, this is a little strange because actually Wonder Woman wasn't that much of a paradigm at this point in time. Um, she was pretty unique, but eh. Anyway, um, so basically he specifically connects lesbianism to hatred of men and actually does the same thing with Batman and Robin at one point as well, suggesting that people, people engage in same-sex relationships not because they're attracted to people of the same sex, but because they've had like a bad experience with the opposite sex uh, or because they have a um, deep-seated hatred of the opposite sex. This is obviously a grotesque portrayal uh, of same-sex relationships uh, and uh, again, uh, informs sort of media perceptions about the practice of homosexuality in a really negative way. Um, so this worked, these observations. Uh, they kind of took off and comics ended up being banned. We'll talk about that extensively in a later class when we look at the Comics Code Authority specifically. Um, so again, I just wanted to highlight how homosexuality altered the course of comics in a prominent way that again, we're still feeling 70 years later. Uh, which is kind of impressive. Um, a fun response that Andy Medhurst wrote in his essay about um, queer superheroes, quote, to avoid being thought queer by Vertham, Bruce and Dick should have done the following. Never show concern if the other is hurt. Live in a shack. Only have ugly flowers in small vases. Call the butler Chip or Joe if you have to have one at all. Never share a couch. Keep your collar buttoned up. Keep your jacket on. And never, ever wear a dressing gown after all. Didn't Noel Coward wear a dressing gown? End quote. So Methurst's point is sort of reflective of how Vertham's argument corresponds with a broader public discourse about the damaging effects of homophobia, particularly on a male bonding. Uh, this is a lot of research that has been pretty well articulated at this point. Um, um, R.W. Connell has done some work on this, um, as a number of other theorists. Uh, basically, the idea is that men's fear of being interpreted as homosexual limits their lives, keeps them from enjoying certain things, uh, and including very meaningful experiences, because they're so afraid that their actions might be interpreted as homosexual, and that they will therefore be shunned, coming back to our brief mention of panopticism um, in our last class. So this is kind of a, an intense thing that we can see really deeply embedded in masculine culture. We can see it in feminine culture as well, um, though most theorists seem to agree it's much stronger in masculine culture, which is way more homophobic, um, which I think kind of makes sense. Um, as a personal anecdote, uh, my experience with this is really silly and stupid and adorable and reflects my privilege. Um, but at one point when I was a teenager, we went to McDonald's with my friends and I ordered a strawberry milkshake and they all made fun of me because the strawberry milkshake is pink. And the next time we went to McDonald's, um, I ordered an inferior vanilla milkshake. Uh, now, to be clear, strawberry milkshakes are the best milkshakes. Chocolate milkshakes are basic. If you like chocolate milkshakes, you're basic. It's an obvious, easy choice. I don't mind telling you that. Uh, vanilla milkshakes are, um, I don't even know. I don't think anybody even orders them. I could be wrong about all of this. It's possible I'm projecting some of my insecurities. Uh, the point is, I specifically ordered an inferior milkshake because of my fear of homophobia, even manifest at a subconscious level, which I think is... I don't know, telling uh, of how deep this stuff runs. Now, being ridiculed for your choice of milkshake is very different from being told who you can love uh, or for being unsafe uh, in a space as a result of people being afraid. So uh, again, this is kind of a deep-seated, important argument that Vertham is playing off of and that Medhurst is calling our attention to. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so as mentioned, we don't have to do much with this because we're going to come back to it uh, in a later class. Uh, the institutional response to Vertham's movement was um, comics actually went to the Senate in a series of Senate trials uh, to decide whether or not literally the U.S. government was going to allow them to exist. Uh, they reached a compromise, which was the CCA, which was a um, censorship body that decided what you could and could not print in comics and had to approve literally every page of your comic book before it could be published. Uh, it explicitly banned what they called, quote, sex perversion or any inference to same, end quote, in 1954. Everyone knew what this meant. This meant no homosexuality. 
Um, so the result was if comics wanted to represent any form of homosexuality, uh, any form of same-sex attraction or relationships, um, they had to do it subtextually, and that's what they did. Now, on the other side of this, uh, comics have been used to vilify same-sex relationships or even you know, any form of queer sexuality um, for a long time using some fairly compelling widespread patterns. So throughout comics history, many villains have been coded as queer, either through gender nonconformity, so they like um, act effeminate if they're male, or they act extremely masculine if they're female, or through subtle or sometimes not subtle uh, attraction behavior toward a same-sex superhero. Uh, the poster child for this is the Joker, whose fondness and obsession for Batman border on sexual slash romantic, uh, and Batman heroically defeating the guy who is expressing attraction toward him. Uh, again, affirms Batman's heterosexuality in a extremely hero coding way, uh, suggesting that you know if if a man is attracted to you, you should punch them in the face, assert that you're not into that, and you're the hero. So you can really see how this would have a profound effect, especially on young children who have frequently been the target audience for superhero comics. Um, not anymore, though. We'll we'll talk about that in a later class. And then um, there's a bit of a double standard. A lot of times that same sort of uh, attraction element between the villain and the hero, when you pour it over to the superheroine, our, our subject of our last lecture, uh, it, it's often eroticized more. Um, so what I mean by that is um, their embrace is sexualized visually, again, because of visual double standards in comics, um, to the point that it seems performance again for the male gaze. Um, we can come back to um, Phoenix's nipples, which we talked about in another class, and I would really like to not make a theme of this course. Um, she's aggressively attacking the White Queen who is in her underpants, and Phoenix has really protruding nipples. Why? Uh, except to kind of make this a, a slightly sexual embrace. There's a lot of sexual symbolism in comics with regards to this, this same sort of um, villain-heroine dynamic, uh, including what's called labial symbolism. Um, which is, or sometimes it's called, I think, oneric symbolism. Anyway, um, either way, the idea is that they use visual images that um, correspond to female genital anatomy uh, in order to make some of these ideas clear. Um, this might sound like overreading. No, we have creators on the record talking about this. They're doing it intentionally in many cases. I'm sure it can happen accidentally and often does, um, but we also know that it does happen 100% intentionally. Um, a good example of this is actually on Wonder Woman's lasso. Uh, which is often made into shapes a la Georgia O'Keeffe, um, to use a crude comparison. Okay, so jumping back to the other side of this, uh, comics have been accused of being extremely homoerotic basically always, and that doesn't go away uh, when Frederick Wertham comes along. Like WWE wrestling, comics have frequently been cited as examples of subversive male-oriented homoeroticism in our culture being socially accepted as well. Uh, so the comparison here is on um, WWE wrestling, which is like greased up giant attractive men in underpants rolling all over each other. You can't miss that. Uh, the superhero is um, technically frequently a nude. This is something we should talk about. Um, so the reason superheroes wear tights is because they're actually drawn as nudes. You just add a few lines so that it looks like they're wearing briefs. Uh, but the musculature that's visible is impossible with any form of clothing, including tights. Um, this leads to another representation of women we didn't talk about in the last unit, um, which is called the boob sock. I, I'm sorry, that's the term for it. I, I, I know that sounds kind of crass, uh, but that's that's how it's actually discussed, uh, which is the way that their breasts are, they should be flattened by the fabric they're wearing, but they're not. Uh, the fabric sort of fits perfectly like skin, um, which is again, a, a, not an example of non-iconic abstraction. Uh, so the point is uh, that superheroes have been discussed extensively. Um, both anecdotally and critically, where you'll have like people saying, um, I grew up in a community where homosexuality was not accepted, uh, and I read Superman comics and formed a massive crush on him. Uh, and it was socially acceptable, so long as I didn't let anyone know that it was a romantic or sexual thing uh, in my mind. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, Leslie Fielder talks about this extensively and suggests that it is in no way abnormal that, that most American art does the exact same thing that subversive homoeroticism is extensive. Uh, and I think history and um, culture bear that out to a pretty tremendous degree. Uh, the, the problem being um, the fundamental problem of queer theory, 
that you're trying to identify and study patterns from people who were specifically kind of hiding, uh, who, who didn't want the queerness of their texts to be identified, but at the same time kind of did. Uh, and this gets into things like um, um, dog whistling and even queer baiting in a strange way, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now that homophobic element also leads to what might be the biggest contradiction in representation of sexuality in superhero comics. Uh, here is um, Reinhold Reitberger and Wolfgang Fuchs writing in the 1970s. Quote, superheroes as well as supervillains seem to have absolutely nothing to show underneath their tight-fitting tights. They all appear to be poor androgynous beings, hermaphrodites who lack the primary sexual organs. Jack Kirby's figures, who always stand with their feet at least four feet apart, make this pretty obvious. So what I mean by this is we identify superhero comics as hypermasculine fantasy. Um, Scott Bucatman, that, that's the, the exact term he uses to describe it, hypermasculine fantasy. He says the only exception is X-Men. Um, which is um, effeminate and queer. Anyway, so the point is that a figure like Thor, let's say, is supposed to be the manliest manly man, 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 man ever. Uh, and he literally has no penis. So you're representing all these symbols of iconic masculinity, like giant bulging muscles, chiseled jawlines, broad shoulders, you name it, no penis. Uh, so the most fundamental defining aspect uh, of gender slash sex uh, from a masculine perspective in comics at this time and he doesn't have one that's kind of weird uh, the theory is that it's again an expression of homophobia that men are so afraid of being seduced maybe to use Vertham's term uh, by male genitalia that they would rather it not exist at all and what does that say with the castration anxiety we talked about in the movie I don't know. This is a fun contradiction. It's really weird. My favorite example of it that I discuss too often uh, is in the Fantastic Four movie that they made. The, the Not the first one, technically. The one with, um, um, well, Ewan Griffith and Jessica Alba. And Captain America as the Human Torch. Nobody wants to talk about that. Anyway, uh, what they did was um, they basically sold the movie on come see Jessica Alba's body in a really tight costume, right? That was the pitch. Like, like watch the trailer. You can see them constructing that desire, let's call it. Uh, and then famously, what actually happened was they showed the movie to test audiences because Mr. Fantastic, played by Ewan Griffith, was in a similar costume. And the test audiences were intimidated by the size of his bulge uh, in that tight costume. So what they did was, at great expense, they went back and, using CGI, digitally removed that man's penis from the film. That's how threatened audiences feel <laughs> by representations of male genitalia. Um, do I have a point here? No, except that's really strange and there's a whole lot of deep-seated psychology playing out there and we should really ask Freud, but dude's dead. Okay, so let's bring this all to our texts. Uh, so the first one we have is um, a subtextual representation of a queer superhero. Uh, this is Alpha Flight number seven, which came out in 1983. Um, I guess just to, to clarify, Alpha Flight was a wide success. It was a huge success at this point in time, in fact. Uh, all around the world. I, I just didn't want you to think that, like, that I gave you an example because I wanted to do a Canadian example of some obscure comic that nobody read. No, this was a big one. Uh, it just happened to be a big one with Canadian superheroes, some of whom are a little stereotypical. We can let that go. Um, so the main focus here is North Star. Uh, he actually came out in 1992 after a key revision to the Comics Code Authority that allowed him to do so. Uh, prior to this, his sexuality could only be rendered subtextually. But nonetheless, in 1992, he became the first canonically gay superhero at Marvel Comics. A huge thing. He was also the subject of the first gay wedding in Marvel superhero comics, which was a big event and was like on the cover of the comic. Uh, so North Star is a really important figure in this discourse. Um, I could have given you one of those later stories. I wanted to give you this subtextual one because there's a, a way in which this represents a very common practice in comics. Uh, in terms of how to represent a character as a homosexual without actually having them engage in any kind of same-sex inference, uh, to use the Comics Code's phrasing. Okay, so he's created by John Byrne, uh, a very famous Canadian um, comics creator. Uh, Byrne says this, quote, There needs to be gays in comics because there are gays in real life. No other reason. The population of the fictional world should represent the real world. That's why I created North Star. I felt that the Marvel Universe needed a gay superhero, even if I would never be allowed to say it in so many words in the comics themselves. 
and I felt that I should create one rather than retrofitting an existing character. So textually what we have in this story is North Star has an old friend, not a gal pal, but same basic trope, uh, inverted across gender lines. Uh, and his friend gets killed and he goes murdery, revengey. I didn't even give you the second half of the story, which is the revenge part, because not much happens in it, other than revenge. Oh, and Danielle did it, by the way. She was in on it. Anyway, um, so we have this introduction to this character of Raymond. Subtextually, it's pretty clear what has happened here. Uh, North Star has had a relationship with Raymond uh, that is described as like like loving and mentoring and deeply important to North Star. Um, so they meet after a few years apart. He introduces him to his his sister, and he says, "Oh, Raymond, may I present my sister, Jean Marie?" Enchanted, Mr. Belmont. Jean Paul has told me all about you. Raymond said he has. That surprises me a little, my dear. That is an obvious winking reference to North Star's homosexuality and Raymond's perception that North Star wouldn't even share that with his twin sister, which is kind of sad, really. Uh, but may I show how delighted I am that Mother Nature so graciously imparted Jean Paul's features to a woman where handsome may become beautiful. So he's talking about North Star's appearance and how he finds North Star beautiful. Uh, but in the case of North Star's sister, uh, Jean-Marie, uh, all of a sudden it's socially acceptable for him to comment on that, socially acceptable for him to notice that. Uh, so we have uh, some kind of cool um, discussion here, uh, the ways that the subtext is surfacing that we can, again, bring out in discussion form. Again, I really don't want to step on all your possible arguments. Now, in terms of that mentoring relationship, uh, it comes up later when a narrative caption says, quote, and Raymond had led him out of that dark fear into the bright, clear light of self-acceptance. End quote. Uh, so this is a very heroic portrayal. Uh, the idea being that North Star was closeted, essentially, uh, and experiencing a lot of anger uh, and, and resentment. This is a depressing and dark time in his life. And Raymond taught him to come out of that. He, he may have saved this guy's life. Uh, and that's obviously the, um, the core of the emotional relationship between the two of them. Now, we should also note that this relationship is not coded as um, strictly homosexual. Uh, North Star is a little surprised by this. He, he mentions to be a little shocked that Raymond has a daughter. Um, but this is even more important at this time in Marvel Comics history, that we're having the portrayal of a same-sex relationship that isn't essentialist in nature. Jean-Paul isn't clearly just homosexual, and Raymond isn't clearly just homosexual. Sexuality is portrayed as potentially fluid, at least in Raymond's case, which is much more in keeping with what we currently know about human sexuality. Uh, and a huge, huge point of, I don't know, conflict, let's say, in contemporary queer theory. The debate between the essentialists and the non-essentialists. Um, I don't have time to get too deep into that, but I, I would love if you want to take that up in the discussion forums, because there are so many voices on all sides of this argument. It's a really fundamental debate. I encourage you to look into it a little bit. So all in all, we have um, some winking references to North Star sexuality. Uh, in this particular issue. And as I said, um, they're more complex than you might expect them to be in 1983. There's a lot happening. From there, eh, he gets fridged. Um, we talked about that a little bit. He, he dies in order to motivate North Star to be angry to fight the villain. That's problematic. There's also the problematic trope of the queer characters being killed off. Think um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, in which Tara, massive spoiler, but it's been over a decade. Um, just kind of dies to make Willow go evil. Uh, and a lot of people really didn't like that. They thought it was um, cruel to eliminate a prominent queer character so nonchalantly. And we could argue the same thing's happening for Raymond, but I don't think it's this fair in that sense because we literally meet him in this issue. Um, nonetheless, he is important just in terms of the precedent that he's setting in this relationship that we see between him and North Star. Okay, second text. This one I'm guessing you, I don't know, probably had an easier time reading just because it's, you know, less old. It's sometimes hard to get students these days to engage with 1983 comics. Um, this one's a little old too, by 2013. Anyway, um, so by 2013, Marvel had embraced the need for representation of LGBTQ plus characters. Um, Kieran Gillen, the writer, actually won a GLAAD award for this comic, um, which is prompt um, for obvious reasons. Um, here is Keith Friedlander, an academic who's written about this. There's actually been a few academics who've written about this book, despite it being relatively old uh, in terms of um, academics taking it up. 
Uh, anyway, Friedlander, who is, by the way, a really nice guy. I've known him for years. He suggests that the book is able to, quote, represent a positive and normalized gay relationship while exploring the tensions inherent in living in a heteronormative world, end quote. Um, so what he means by this is that you have the superhero team actually representing metaphorically a sort of queer community. Uh, and that us versus the rest of the world mentality reflects the, let's say, dangers or tensions uh, of being um, I'm queer in a heteronormative world. Uh, Friedlander also suggests, quote, this suggests that sexuality is not static and neither an inborn trait nor a choice, but a complex and cultivated relationship to oneself and other people played out through their shared intimacy. Gillen and McKelvey go on to essentially establish all of the Young Avengers as queer youth. Now this can lead to some problems, most notably ghettoization. Um, there is a perception at Marvel, or of Marvel, um, and DC as well, that when they say that they want to have queer representation, they mean that they want to have one book siloed off from the rest of their universe where queer things are allowed to happen. Uh, and the fact that this book has so many queer characters in contrast to most all other Marvel comics, which have none, might suggest the exact same thing. Uh, it, it's more or less a form of tokenism. Um, nonetheless, it exists and is a thing and is being widely studied uh, and is so beloved um, by the people who loved this series. So what we see within the series, again, is a portrayal of a fluid sexuality. Um, these characters are not essentialist. They're not really easily defined. Um, maybe the biggest leap here would be with Loki, who is an iconic and much beloved character. Um, so having Loki express same-sex desire towards David um, is potentially controversial. Um, the rest of these characters were kind of not on firm footing yet, and none of them were really iconic other than Loki. Um, many of them were actually cast off characters from other books uh, that Gillen picked up and made kind of cool. Uh, and then the, the, the prominent relationship uh, that we see not as much in this issue, you do see it, uh, is the fundamental relationship between Wiccan and Hulkling, um, which is one of Marvel Comics' most famous sort of canonical queer relationships. Uh, again, a same-sex relationship. Um, as scholars have noted, it wasn't always portrayed very, what's the word I'm looking for here, prominently? Like, they were clearly in love with each other, but their relationship existed for something like 12 years before they were even allowed to be seen having a kiss on panel. Uh, and that was just a few years before this series comes out. Um, so Gillen moves away from that and allows them to have a strong uh, same-sex parent uh, that's not played up as a big deal, necessarily. Like, they're in a relationship, they have all kinds of problems, but those characters aren't defined solely by that relationship. So again, trying to sidestep this problematic element of tokenism. That's what we're seeing in Young Avengers. It has been called the queerest single issue comic book that Marvel Comics has ever produced. Um, and again, we can, we can talk about it in the discussion forums. I wonder what questions we'll ask in the discussion forums. And here we go. So having studied the superhero for a few lectures now, how do the themes, symbols, and aims of that genre of comics work with the representation of LGBTQ plus characters? What does the superhero have to offer for portrayals of queer sexuality? Why is it important that this genre in particular have queer representation? So I just want you to think about what the superhero genre of comics can do for queer representation. And again, why queer representation might be particularly important in this genre, or even go the other direction and suggest why it doesn't matter. It's much more important that we have queer representation in film or TV. That's totally cool as well. Um, but I just want you to talk about that intersection between sexuality and form that's so pivotal to our course. And then question two, which is too long and I apologize. Um, let's go transmedia. How does the portrayal of queer superheroes in these texts compare to the portrayal of the same in the Disney-owned cash cow juggernaut that is the MCU? You can think about textually queer characters like Valkyrie or that one guy in the support group scene in Endgame <laughs> that they teased as like they were going to have representation of queer people in Marvel Comics. And it's one dude in one throwaway scene. And yeah, he's played by the director and good on him for that, but that's nah, disappointing. Uh, or since that wasn't much of a payoff, you can think about subtextual queerness in the MCU, which is obviously a thing, uh, such as Cap and Bucky, Cap and Tony, Captain Falcon and we're seeing a pattern there <laughs> or whatever else you could think of um, I don't want to tell you how to read America's ass um, so I will see you in the discussion forums and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about America's ass I'm so sorry <laughs>